and amen. Turn to someone today, say, I've been praying all week to sit by you. And you can be seated. Just trying to help out some of the single folk. That's all we're <laughs> trying to do. <laughs> Open up your Bibles this morning, if you brought them, to the book of Matthew. We're gonna look at Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we wanna welcome not only all of you here to Word of Life Church today, we also wanna wel welcome everyone who is watching online. We've got Keon all the way from Belize, what? Now for those of you who know Keon, Keon is our drummer. Uh, and he's the guy who stands while he drums. I don't even know how that's physically possible. Uh, but Keon, like NASA hired him and like stole him away from this place. So, you know, doggone NASA. Uh, but uh, he's like super smart and intelligent. He goes around and like tracks depths uh, for the government, for ships, of knowing how far they can pull in into coast. And they've got him stationed out of all the places in the world they could send this boy. They sent him to Belize. And I watch him on Instagram, and he's like sitting on the most serene beach. And I'm like, I want that government job. Like, give me that government job. So, Keon, man, we love you. Come home. We can't wait to see you. We've got Heather from Tuskegee University, and we've got Tony from Smyrna, uh, Tennessee. Let's give it up for them and everyone else who's watching <laughs> online today. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to see you all real soon. Uh, do any of you remember Lazy Boy recliners? Any of you, yes, anybody? Lazy Boy recliners. Uh, my childhood was spent at my grandparents' house. My mamma is actually here today on the front row. Uh, let's give it up for my mamma. She is one of the most amazing women I have ever met. You talk about strength, uh, just strength of character, strength of faith. Her prayers changed our families. Any of you, el anybody else in here have some relatives whose prayers changed your families, like some mothers or grandmothers or great-grandmothers? Um, I, I tuck my kids in um, uh, almost every night and when they're going off to bed and I'm watching them, it's like we, we close, we pray, they pray. And it's like, we wouldn't be doing that every night had that woman not have prayed. You'll never know, you'll never know the ramifications of you making the decision to live for Jesus. Not just in your life, but in the lives of now, her great-grandchildren, they are serving Jesus because she made a decision to serve Jesus even when no one in her family was. Come on, somebody. How many of you know it pays to serve God? So I was over at their house all the time, and uh, my grandmother would always have these big Sears catalogs. Any of you familiar with the Sears catalogs? I love those things, right? Like even in a digital age, you give me Blockbuster and a Sears catalog, uh, and my eight-year-old self within me will just come to life. Uh, because I loved opening up that Sears catalog and my grandmother would let me circle all the things that I would want for Christmas, like all the things that I would want. So I'd be in there circling those things and my papa would come home from work and he would always get in his lazy boy recliner. Uh, he'd get in and you know, you have a little handle on the end of it and you'd whip that thing out and like the, the legs would pop out from underneath you and your back would decline and you're in this decline position. And without fail, within 30 minutes, he would always be sound asleep. Now, when I say sound asleep, so asleep that no one else in the house could sleep because he would snore so loud. Like, <laughs> I mean, like so, so loud. Uh, and so, you know, me being a child, I'm going to see what all I can do to wake him up. And so I would do random things to see how far I could push the limits to like get him up and out of the chair, scare him or do something to get him out. Uh, and in these moments, whenever he did wake up, he couldn't get out of the chair. It'd be like a baby T-Rex, you know, trying to overcome, you know, the belly. <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't get up. Uh, until finally he would lower the decline and incline, you know, hit the little lever and would incline. And when he inclined, he could get out of the chair. But there was no hope ever for him to get out of that lazy boy recliner until he in inclined from the decline. If he would incline, he could come out, but as long as he stayed declined, he was staying exactly where he was. So this is where I'm taking this message today. No, not about lazy boys, but about inclining. Your soul has to get up in order for your life to come out. 
And if your soul does not get up, your life will never come out of whatever it may be in. Now, this is interesting. If you've ever read the book of Psalms, if you haven't, I encourage you, read the book of Psalms. Uh, You will see men in there who are writing, and they love the Lord Jesus. I mean, these people love Jesus. God, and in the middle of all this, just like your lives, they'd find their lives going through things. How many of you have ever been through something? I want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you are going through something right now? Uh, and they would go through things, and they would write about what they were going through. It's, all, it's fascinating how David and others would talk to God in the book of Psalms. It's almost like he was their counselor. You know, it wasn't about rules and these and thous. It was like, God, I am struggling with this, and these people want to kill me, and that scares me. (laughs) And it's like, of course it would. And they would tell God about all these things. It's like, I'm really frustrated about my lack of progress, and this makes me angry. When they did this to me, God, it made me angry. But all throughout these moments where it seemed like that they were being kind of overcome by people or overcome by life or frustration, David and these men would write things like, but hope thou in God, my soul, not my mouth, my soul will make its boast in God. I will incline my heart to God. God will be my rear guard. God will be my strong tower. His name, I will run into his name. Don't forget, oh my soul, all the benefits of God. You would see the psalmist make his soul, his mind, his will, his emotions, arise unto God. What David was basically saying in these moments and the psalmist were saying is, don't forget God. Like, I know I'm going through a test and a trial and a struggle, and when I think about that test and that trial and struggle, or I guess you could put it this way, the way I know I'm thinking about that test, that trial, that struggle is I'm frustrated, I'm upset, I'm anxious, I'm scared, I'm mad, I'm, even on the positive end of emotions, determined, or whatever it may be, But I am so aware of my struggle that the way I know I am aware of it is all of these emotions are coming out of my soul. Now, the book of Proverbs, this is one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, and I love this verse in in Proverbs 18 and verse 14. In the Message Bible, it says this, a healthy spirit can conquer adversity. But what can you do when the spirit is crushed? Now, I love this because what he's saying is, and all of our lives will face adversity, but if your soul is healthy while you're facing the adversity, you can walk right through it. I mean, when you're going through something, if your soul, your, your mind, your will, your emotions, your internal man, David would say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is what? Within me, bless his holy name, because he knew That if I go through adversity with a healthy soul, I can make it through any adversity. But if this thing gets in me, if this thing gets in my soul, if the care of this gets in my soul, it is not going to be well in my life. What what he's saying is, is you're only as well as your soul. Like this is why John wrote in 3 John 2, he said, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as what? Your soul prospers. And here's what he's saying. He's like, I know all of us are focused on these external things like being healthy and seeing progress. But he says, you know what? Even if you're healthy and seeing progress, if your soul's not healthy, you're only as well as your soul. Like you've got to have this peace, this joy. It's amazing. I've been to parts all over the world. I mean, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to Africa, I've been to South America, I've been to Asia, I've been all over the world. I have seen abject poverty, like poverty that would absolutely blow your mind if you saw it. And a lot of times, what shocks me about these people is they're happier than most people I see in America. And you know why? It's not because their physical life has prospered, but their soul has. They found a way to have peace even where they are, joy even where they are, contentment and love even while they are. Their soul is prospered, therefore they're good. It's like, how are you? I'm good. 
And a lot of times for us, we focus on so much out here, even with, in regards to our faith, what we're believing God for, we focus so much on the stuff out here that we forget about our soul health. Like one of the questions you should ask the people that you love a lot and just see where it goes is this, how's your soul? How's your soul? Like, how, how are you? Not just how are you and give me the basic fine. Like, how's your soul? How are you processing this? How's your, how's your soul processing this adversity? I, I know you may be going through sickness and your body may be not doing very well, but how's your soul? Because if your soul is healthy, you can make it through any adversity. We, we use this example a lot, but it's the best one I know. So since it's so good, I'll just keep using it. It's the difference between you being in a pool and the pool being in you. Like I love taking my kids to the pool. My kids love going to the pool. Why? You can play in the pool. You can shoot water guns in the pool. You can be all up in the pool. But when the pool gets all up in you, it's the difference between swimming and drowning. And you can be in the middle of a test or a trial and be fine. You'll make it through. You'll walk right through the valley of the shadow of death with a restored soul, with a sound mind, with a mind that's drank from still waters and ate from green pastures. You can walk right through the valley of the shadow of death. But if your soul's not right, in the same pool that before you could swim in, you're drowning in it. And it's like, why is this marriage stuck here? Why can't we get out of this funk or whatever it is? Like, what in the world is going on? Why can't I just seem to break out? It's a soul issue. And this is why this is so important, is we know we have an adversary, we have an enemy. Did you know, though, that the chief way he comes against you is to attack your mind? Watch what Paul writes here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, in the King James. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. So he says, God's given you weapons to pull down some strongholds. Great. Where are these strongholds at? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He says, here's what spiritual warfare does. He says, Satan's gonna attack your mind. He's gonna come and tell you you're not gonna make it. He's gonna come and tell you you're a terrible mother. He's gonna tell you, look, you've tried before. You don't know what to do. He's gonna tell you, well, why don't you just give up now? You tried it the last time and it didn't work. He's gonna try to shame you into more sin. He's gonna try to tell you no one will understand. He's gonna tell you, well, if you admit that to anyone, as soon as you admit that, they're gonna reject you, so you might as well just keep living a lie. The way he attacks you is he attacks your soul Because he knows if he can defeat you internally, it is only a matter of time before he defeats you externally. This is what he is after, which is why Proverbs, it says, you've got to guard your heart, for out of your heart flow the boundaries of your life. That, That word issues literally means boundaries. You know what that means? You'll never go further than your heart. And what Satan is wanting to do in all of our lives is to wear out and exhaust our soul, fill it with lies, fill it with all these things, and make our souls absolutely overwhelmed. And in America, we've never seen more of it. We're seeing pastors, I mean pastors, literally, walk away from the the, the Christian faith. We're seeing pastors take their own lives. I mean, young pastors who go through all these things and face and have beautiful families and wives and all those other types of things. It's like, what in the world is going on? We see this rise of depression medication and this rise of anxiety medication and this rise of all of these things. And it's because the adversary of our soul knows he's just that. The adversary, not just of your life, he is the adversary of your soul. And if you don't practice good soul health, he has got you exactly where he wants you. So I'm gonna ask, how's your soul? David said, I notice about my soul, it can get overwhelmed, it can get sad, it can get frustrated, so I need to incline my soul unto God. I need to fix my focus on the Lord. I need to make my boast. My soul needs to think about just how good God is. And how many of you know this is the difference between worship and singing? 
Singing engages the body. Worship engages the soul. Singing will go through the motions of God is faithful, faithful you are, faithful you ever will be. Yes, great, that's singing. The soul will come in and say, you know what? God has been faithful. This is not my first rodeo. Just like God got me through it the last time, God's gonna get me through it this time. Faithful you are and faithful you will forever be. See, even at the tell in there, some people were engaging their body of it's turning around right now. Turning around right now. Turning around right now. Singing. Singing's great. Do you know what's better? Worship. And David said, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. What's he talking about? It is turning around right now. I do serve a God of miracles. With God, all things are possible. So it is turning around right now. That's the difference. One singing, the other one is worship. Worship demands the soul. It demands me to incline myself to, you know what? I'm not alone. God is with me. Now, if you want to see God move and you want to have a healthy soul, this is absolutely the attitude you must have. In Matthew chapter 14, we see the disciples with Jesus, and Jesus is just being Jesus, which means he's awesome. How many of you know Jesus is awesome? Yes, he is. And so he gets done preaching. He's like, well, you know, I know that was that, and we're moving on. You guys get in a boat, cross over to the other side, and I'm not gonna get in with you instead of like taking it easy in the boat and letting you row me. I'm actually gonna walk around the entire lake. And they're like, Jesus, there's a mountain there. He's like, I know. I'm gonna climb it and get this. I'm gonna pray while I do. <laughs> it's like, you're just too awesome. You're too awesome, Jesus. And so they just follow him. They in, obey the instruction and they get in the boat. And while they're in the boat, they cross over and a storm comes. And in the middle of this storm, they're panicked and all those other things. They see Jesus walking and they're like, is it a ghost? And they cry out for fear. Let's pick up the story from there. Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 27. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, that's important, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. When he saw the circumstances, when he saw it not changing, when he saw something life-threatening, when he saw something that wasn't right, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Do you see how he lost the inward war before he lost the outward one? I'm gonna say that again. Did you see how he lost the inward war before he lost the outward war? And in verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, wherefore is did you doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind stopped. So the whole time Jesus could have stopped the wind. And they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, of a truth, you are the son of God. Now, there's so much about this, this is, this is in, interesting to me. Now, John wrote, if all the stuff Jesus did was compiled into books, the world in and of itself could not contain the books therein. Like, Jesus did so much. Like, these are not the only miracles Jesus did. These are not the only instances he had with people. There were tons, but these are recorded not just for them to think about, whoa, someone walked on water, but to teach us an important principle. I think the first thing that this principle is trying to teach, not just Peter, but teach you, this story is trying to teach you something, this story is trying to teach me something, is this, is that in your worst moments, God is with you. They're in this boat and they are so frustrated because they're not making progress. You ever been there? You ever felt like you plateaued? It's like, why am I not making progress? Like in their case, it's like we didn't even ask ourselves to cross this lake. God asked us to. And we're here doing our best, doing the Lord's work, not perfect, because we can see from the lives of the disciples, they weren't perfect, but trying. 
Like we're trying to do what God wants us to do, and out of nowhere comes this storm that stops progress. No matter how hard we row, we're not seeing it. You ever been there before? It's like I'm trying to take my life forward, and I'm not seeing progress. This is what happened to Cain back in the Old Testament. You have this principle of like, if I sacrifice now, it's because I want it to be better later. So like my my son is here. He's got a soccer game after this match, sitting on the front row. And so we'll train and practice all the time with the the logic of what I do in practice and, and in private will show up in public. Like I can't expect to walk out with the lights on on game day and expect to be amazing if I haven't done the work in practice. So we're preaching this message all the time. It's the the, the whole point of delayed gratification. And a lot of times it works brilliantly. I mean, yesterday he hit a shot with his left foot. Beautiful goal. Beautiful goal. And it's because of all the work we put in with that left foot throughout the off season to get it to a point where it could show up in public. Because what I do in private tends to show up in public. But sometimes, like with with Cain and and throughout Scripture, like in these moments, It's like I'm doing something in the present that stinks with the expectation that when I get to the future, my future will be better than the present because I'm sacrificing the present to get a better future. You ever been there before? And for Cain, it's like I offer a sacrifice and it's not accepted. It's like I give you this and it costs me something in the present and it not only takes something for my present, but you're saying it's not going to alter my future whatsoever? And when he gets in this, what happens? He gets mad, man. He gets angry. His soul, how's your soul, Cain? I want to kill somebody. Like, how's your soul, Cain? I'm so frustrated. And while we can look at that and, like, judge him, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, don't fall for the spirit of Cain. And we do it all the time. I'll give you a little instance. Have you ever had, like, a really good week where, like, you worked out? You genuinely worked out? You ate clean or at least moderately clean? and you get on the scale and you gain two pounds? It's like, you feel like Cain. It's like, what, you wanna take the, 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 I'm never getting on you again, scale, throw it against the wall. Go out and, you know, eat some candy. You wanna gain two pounds, we're gonna gain it the right way at least. Because we just expect that if I give life my best, life will give me its best. And here they're in this moment where it's like, we've done nothing but obey God. We've done nothing but do what he told us to do. This was his idea, not our idea. I'm in the middle of a storm, and I am not seeing any progress. No matter how hard I try, how hard I work, it's not getting better. You ever been there? It goes from frustration over to downright fear. Because you've got professional fishermen on this boat, Peter being one of them. Peter is kind of like one of the chief characters in this story because he is a fisherman. So like all the people who aren't fishermen are like, what do we do? You're the one who was raised on boats and dealt with situations like this. What do we do? He's like, I don't know. How many of you know it's a problem when the professionals are freaking out? Like if you're on a plane and the pilot opens the door and says, oh my gosh, and starts running down the aisle, you better pray. Because when the professionals are panicking, you know you're in trouble. And Peter's panicking. He doesn't know what he's going to do. Afraid, petrified. You know, I, I was telling somebody this the other day. I said, when I was young, I had a lot of responsibility. But I think I was so young, I was too dumb to be afraid. You know, because it's like, nah, I don't have too much to lose because I hadn't had much. But as I've aged, and honestly, as I've seen God bless even more, I tend to wrestle with fear more now than I did then because I have something to lose. Isn't that interesting? And Peter's so afraid here because, do you know, Peter was married. Peter had a mother-in-law, which means Peter had a wife. He's married, and he's about to lose his life. At least it feels that way. And it's like, God, where are you? And the whole time, Jesus has walked off the mountain. He's right there on the water. And it's like, God, come on now. If you're in the story, why in the world would you not intervene? 
If you're in the story, why in the world wouldn't you stop and change the story? God, if you're in the room, why wouldn't you alter this? God, if you're in the room, why wouldn't you heal? God, if you're in the room and you're everywhere, loving, compassionate, all these types of things. God, if you're on the water, why is the storm so bad we think we're all about to die? And here's what's interesting about God, and this is a big theology shift. God's not a genie, he's a father. Did you know that? Now, I don't know much about genies. Like, the full breadth of my knowledge about genies all comes from Disney and Aladdin. Like, that's all I know about a genie is what Aladdin taught me. And what I've seen about genies and Aladdin is, one, like, everyone's first wish, of course, would be to get unlimited wishes, so they took away that. Uh, and here you got this kid. He gets this lamp, and he's like, I'm going to rub it. My genie's going to pop out, and he's going to get me what I want. And when I get what I want, now everything will be happy. When I get what I want, now everything will be better. And when I get what I want, everything will be easy. When I get what I want, everything will be A-OK. Just rub the lamp, get the genie, get what I want. Until he rubs the genie, uh, rubs the lamp, gets the genie. And ask, and he gets exactly what he wants, and he finds out what I want. I actually had unintended consequences that I didn't foresee coming. And when I asked her that, it altered this, and it altered this, and it altered this. And mm, that might not have been good for me. And throughout the story, it's like, Jeannie, just get back in your lamp. Jeannie, like, don't come out right now. Jeannie, I don't want your wisdom. I don't want your counsel. I don't want your advice. I don't want your help. I just want you to do what I ask you to do. And you know what we do with God? It's that way all the time. It's like, God, I just want to rub the lamp, get you to come out and do what I want. And, you know, this whole, like, ah, consecration thing, dedication thing, like this, ah, I don't know about all that, but we sure could use fill in the blank right now. But God's not a genie, he's a father. Now, as a father, I'm a father. Man, I love my kids. And as a father, I am keenly interested not only in what they're asking for, but more importantly, their development. I want to see them grow in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man, Luke 2, 42. I want to see them excel. I want to see them gain wisdom. And if they're not developing, it concerns me because what I care about in my children's life is more about who they're becoming than what they're obtaining, I care about their character. I care about the part of them you can't see, which leads to the part of them you will see. I care not just about what they want for Christmas, but what kind of husbands they're gonna be. I care not, right? Don't we all? Like, we care about what they want for their birthdays, but more than that, it's like, are you going to be a good father? Like, I care more about their character, their development, than I do about just answering their requests. Because there's some stuff that they would ask of me that if I did what they asked me to do, it would absolutely hinder their development. There are moments where like they're doing math and I know they just want me to do the math for them. I'd have to Google it too. Uh, but you know, you, right? It's like, Google it. Yeah, so, but anyway, like I'm, I'm sitting there and it's like, I know I could, I could write the paper. I could write the paper. I could do the science project. I could take the tests. Like I could do all these things to make it easier for you. But would that actually be good for you? Would it actually be if you went to school and I took all your tasks and I did all your homework and I did all your papers and I did all your projects and I made the, the volcanic, you know, volcano spew with baking soda and I dyed it red and I made it all happen for you and just sent you out the door with the project for you to get the A. And I just, every time you asked me for help, I just jumped in and did the problem for you instead of showing you how to do the problem. And so oftentimes with God, it's like, whoop, God, fix it. And God is like, I care about who you're becoming. And you know what he wants built in you almost above anything else? I, I think of forgiveness, I think of devotion. But one of the chief things I think about when God is looking to develop you, the word that comes to my mind the most is this, faith, faith. Whole chapter about it, Hebrews chapter 11. A great in heaven, a great hall of faith. Not fame, faith. Look at how they believe God and how they believe God and how they came and they wanted to take this baby from Moses, uh, from Moses' mama, and she stayed in so much faith. Now, not only did her baby not die, but someone actually began to pay her to watch the baby because she had enough faith to put it in the river and trust God, God would make a way. Isn't that inspiring? The faith of Sarah. 
counting God faithful. You know what? He did do that one time, and he did do this one time, and he did do that one time, and because he did this this time, I believe he can do it now, the faith of Abraham. I come and says, I know God loves me, and he loves this boy, and even if I have to set him on fire, God can take the ashes, breathe life back into it, and give me back my son. Faith, faith, faith. You know what? God wants that in you. He's trying to get the fear out of these boys, the panic out of these boys, the whining out of these boys. He's trying to get them to stand up and believe God is ever present and with me right now on the water. And Peter makes the decision to trust God. You know what he does? He inclines his soul into who's out there on the water with him and he looks straight at Jesus. He steps out of the boat and he begins to see a living, breathing miracle in his life. And you know what I want for you? I want you to see a living, breathing miracle. I want God to be real to you. I don't want like a cute Sunday church, which is cute Sunday Christianity where it's like, "Mm, we're good and we take the pictures and it's like, yes, Lord, and like all these types of things. But you see a healer. That you feel his presence. That you see him change what everybody else told you would never change. That you see improvement. That you see development. That you see addictions and chains fall off you like wax being melted by the mighty power and fire of a living God. Like, I want him real. And you know what it takes to make him real? It's not enough for him to be in the story, for him to be in the room, or for him to be on the lake. You know what it takes to make him real? Faith. And you know what faith does? It inclines its soul into focusing on Jesus. And Peter's in this moment, he's like, Jesus, you will make a way. Jesus, Jesus, his eyes are fixed on Jesus. And the whole time his eyes are fixed on Jesus, he is walking on water. He is seeing a living, breathing miracle. Faith is not just something I've read about. I'm seeing it happen right now. God is being faithful. God is being great. God is being awesome. I've inclined my soul to Jesus until his attention is swayed to the wind and the waves. And his eyes get off of Jesus and it gets over onto these circumstances and his soul begins to decline. Long before his body declined, his soul did. And his soul is wondering, what in the world am I doing out here? And his soul is seeing the adversity and it's seeing the sickness and it's seeing the disappointment and it's seeing the pain and it's seeing the limitations and it's seeing I've been here before and it's seeing all these types of things and it begins to steadily doubt and doubt and doubt. And the whole time he's doubting on the inside, he doesn't even notice he's sinking on the outside. I love how the King James writes it. He begins to sink. Not just drown, he begins sink. It's a metaphor for life. He's losing this world on the the inside and the outside's not changing too much until inch by inch, bit by bit, it's like I can't breathe anymore. He cries out and Jesus picks him up and he asks him this question, where did you doubt, Peter? Where did you doubt? What's the answer to that? The answer was when he became the chief character in the story and not Jesus. When he became the chief character in the story and not Jesus. When he became the deliverer and not Jesus. When he began to look at what he could do compared to the storm instead of what Jesus could do to compare to the storm. And you know what became in that moment? Prideful. Now, I I know no one in here, including myself, would ever consider us to be prideful people. Because what pride does is it exalts oneself above another. That's just the definition of pride. It's like if someone's prideful, they walk in a room and they exalt themselves above someone else. It's like, I'll be the center of the focus. I'll be the center of attention. Woo, they stole my seat. That's my spot. Pride exalts itself above another. And we know not to do that. But whenever fear is there, pride is there. There can be no fear without pride. If fear is there, it's because pride is there. And it's not that we have exalted ourselves above another, it's we have exalted ourselves above God. When fear is present in my life, it's just a sign that pride is in operation. 
And what I'm doing in this moment is I am exalting myself and looking at my capacities to solve this problem. Instead of tuning in my soul and inclining it to the fact that I have a living God who loves me. And later, this same man who was sinking, this same man who took his focus off of Jesus and put it on the problem, he wrote this in 1 Peter, and it's so good in light of this context. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt you in due time. How would I ever humble myself, casting all of my cares upon him? For he affectionately cares for me. The very next verse. So oftentimes, we read one of these verses without reading the next. And these verses, they work together. How do I humble myself under the mighty hand of God? It's not treating myself like a no one. It's not treating myself like I'm a less than. Humbling myself under the mighty hand of God is saying, I have a God and I am not him. I have a hero and I am not him. I have a way maker and I am not him. I have an answer and I am not it. I have a God who is all powerful, almighty, all consuming. So I'm gonna take my life and my focus and I'm gonna fix it on Jesus and believe that he will turn it around right now. I will incline my soul unto God. My soul, it'll make its boast of God. And somebody says, when will it stop? As soon as my soul actually is more fixed on God than the problem. When I see the problem in light of my God instead of my problem in light of God. That with this in this moment, God is the filter for every problem of my life. And now instead of just living life, I'm doing all things through Christ because I can do all things through Christ who is is my strength. When Peter humbled himself and made Jesus the focus of the story, he was exalted. When he was filled with pride and focused on himself, he began began to get lower. And what I want all of us to do is just get in more and more of the habit of just humbling myself. Somebody says, well, how do I do that? Your care list is your prayer list. Your care list is your prayer list. Your worry list is your prayer list. If you're concerned about it, you're praying about it. If you're upset about it, you're praying about it. Not just like later, right then, right there. We're letting God be God. It's standing right there looking at a situation that so disappoints you and maybe you're all around coworkers and everything else, but just under your breath, you say, God be God. God be wisdom right now. God be strength right now. God be grace right now. God be peace right now. God be joy right now. God be the healer right now. God be the restorer right now. God, you be God. You can be God all by yourself. God be God. God be the author and the finisher and the perfecter of my faith. God, you make all things that the enemy meant for evil turn around for my God. God be God. It's standing there right before the phone call saying, God, be my wisdom. God, be my strength. God, be my love, be my joy. Why? Because a prayerless life is a prideful life. It's saying, I can do this without you. If I don't pray before the meeting, what I'm telling God is I can do this meeting without you. If I don't pray while raising my kids, what I'm telling God is I can raise these kids without you. If I don't pray for my church, I'm saying, God, I can grow this church without you. But as soon as I pray, I humble myself under the mighty hand of God and he begins to exalt me in due time because I have cast all of my cares over upon him. A prayerless life is a prideful life. And I'm just gonna let God be God. And when you do that, you call upon the name of Jesus. He picks you up, he takes you back to the boat and peace becomes still over everything. This story began in worry and ended in worshiping. And I want your story. It may have begun in worry, but it's going to end in worship because we know we're not alone. We got a God on the sea. We got a God in the story. We got a God in the room. And with God, all things are possible to him that believes in him. I'm going to let God be God. Today, all over this room, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for everyone in this room who's struggling, who's hurting, who's wounded. Let us all, Father, incline our souls unto you. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that we will not allow our soul to drift from the rock that is you. 
God, be our rock, be our strength, be the glory and the lifter of our heads. And Father, let us lift our heads up and see our redemption coming from you. Right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Joel, I've just been hurting. I've been wounded. Or maybe you've been the one who has hurt someone. You've been the one who has wounded someone. Maybe today you've just been disappointed or depressed. Maybe today you've been disappointed in yourself and you need a touch from Jesus. But the Bible says that we are the sheep of his pasture and all we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have gone astray. There's not a one of us in this room who has not gone astray. All of us have gone astray. But you know what, the shepherd, he'll leave the 99 to go after the one. And that's what this portion of the service is all about. If today you feel astray, if today you wanna come home, if today you wanna come to the Father, if today you wanna come to love, come to peace, if today I have this big in my heart, you wanna just come back to yourself. You've just been so out of kilter lately, so not yourself lately. The word would be lost, you just feel so lost. You know what? God can find you and God can reintroduce you to yourself, but you've got to come home. I'm not going to ask anyone to be embarrassed today. No one's going to look at you. With heads bowed, eyes closed all over this place, you say, Pastor Joel, I'm going to come home today. I want to come to Jesus. Would you do something for me? No one's going to watch you. Would you do something for me? Would you lift your hand up right now all over this place? Hands going up all over the room. All over the room in the balcony in every section. Hands going up all over the room. Amen. Now everyone in here just pray this prayer with me. You can repeat it after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. It's your goodness and your grace. It overtakes me. All of my sins Though they were red like scarlet, they've been washed by the blood of Jesus. My sins have been washed by the blood of Jesus. I've been cleaned by the blood of Jesus. My past is over. My mistakes are over. You've forgiven me, so I forgive myself. And I say boldly, Today is the beginning of the best days of my life in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this YouTube channel. I wanna encourage you to subscribe to the link if you haven't already for more weekly content that I'm sure is going to be a blessing to you as well. Click the link below if you would like to partner with us to help us get this message out to even more people. Thank you so much for your generosity. We'll see you next week.